Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Tesla's 2014 annual shareholder meeting. We're really glad that you could be here with us today. My name is Todd Marin. I'm Tesla's Deputy General Counsel. Uh, momentarily, we'll be welcoming Elon Musk, our co-founder, CEO, and chairman to the stage. Um, I would now like to introduce our board, who's sitting up in the front. Uh, we also have our CFO, Deepak Ahuja, and our Vice President of Investor Relations, Jeff Evanson. We also have representatives here from our independent auditor, PricewaterhouseCoopers. There are two parts to today's meeting. First, we'll have the formal part of the meeting. Uh, it will cover the five items that the company has asked uh, the stockholders to vote on today. After the voting, Elon will provide a brief overview of the company and we'll have a question and answer session. I'll begin by calling Tesla's annual stockholder meeting officially to order. I ask that you refer to the agenda and rules of the meeting that you received earlier today. I declare that the polls are now open. As I mentioned earlier, if you wish to uh, submit a ballot to vote, or if you wish to change your vote, please pick one up at the table and hand it to our inspector of elections, Lisa Brenton, who is in the back. Lisa has taken and signed an oath as inspector of election, and that will be filed with the minutes of today's meeting. ComputerShare has certified that starting on April 24, 2014, the proxy materials or a notice of internet availability of the proxy materials were mailed or provided to all stockholders of record as of April 10, 2014. Copies of these proxy materials and related certificates will be attached to the minutes of today's meeting as well. We have a majority of the outstanding shares represented at the meeting today, so I declare that there is a quorum present and that we may proceed with the meeting. We're conducting the meeting in accordance with Tesla's bylaws. The five items on the agenda today are as follows. First, to elect two Class 1 directors, Elon Musk and Steve Jurvetson, to serve for a term of three years or until their respective successors are duly elected and qualified. Second, to hold a non-binding vote to approve on an advisory basis the to our 2013 Executive Compensation Program. Third, to approve an amendment and restatement of Tesla's 2010 Equity Incentive Plan to specify certain performance goals for and limits on awards that may be granted under the plan. Fourth, to ratify the appointment of PricewaterhouseCoopers as Tesla's independent auditors for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2013. Tesla's board has recommended that our stockholders vote for each of the director nominees and for each of these four items. Finally, we've received a stockholder proposal today regarding supermajority uh, voting provisions in our governing documents. Our board has recommended that our stockholders vote against the stockholder proposal. The stockholder proposal is going to be presented today by James McRitchie, and I understand that Mr. McRitchie is here and he's ready to present his proposal. So Mr. McRitchie, if you can step to the microphone, we'll give you a couple minutes here. Thank you. Thank you very much. First, I want to say that uh, I'm excited to be a share owner of Tesla. Our company has shown that combating climate change can be more exciting than contributing to it. That's the best car ever tested by Consumer Reports. And with the recently announced EPA power plant uh, reductions, uh, our cars will be even cleaner. Tesla is a great company, but even great companies can be improved. I'd like our corporate governance standards to someday match our engineering standards. That's why I propose to eliminate Tesla's supermajority voting requirements. I'm not, and I think that doing so will help us to attract more institutional share owners. I'm not alone in my opposition to supermajority requirements. Many see them as an, an impediment to good governance. For example, the Council of Institutional Investors whose members have over $3 trillion in invested assets, includes the following in their policies on corporate governance concerning voting requirements. A majority vote of common shares outstanding should be sufficient to amend company bylaws or to take other action that requires or receives a share owner vote. Supermajority votes should not be required. Thank you. 
and I ask for your aye vote. Thank you, Mr. McRitchie. I would like to remind our stockholders that Tesla's board has prepared a statement in opposition to Mr. McRitchie's statement, and that's found in our proxy statement. They've again recommended that you vote against that proposal. Uh, before we finish the meeting, uh, the formal part of the meeting, I would just ask, are there any proxies remaining in the audience that have not been submitted? So if you could please find Lisa, or Lisa, if you could come gather the remaining proxies. We'll just wait for them to be handed in. Thank you. We will attempt to calculate the, uh, at least the unofficial tally and announce that at the end of the meeting as well. But we'll just wait for the rest of the votes to be handed in. There's one more over here. Over here. Anyone else? One more over here. Okay, I don't see any more hands up. Uh, I declare that the polls are now closed. As I said, uh, we will announce the unofficial results later in the meeting, and we will formally announce the official results of the voting uh, with a filing uh, on an 8K form with the SEC within four business days of today's meeting. Now that the formal part of today's meeting is adjourned, I welcome you to stay for Elon's presentation. We'll also leave time at the end for your questions. Uh, when you ask your questions, I would ask that you limit them to one question, you try to keep them focused on the business of the company, and uh, that you keep them brief so that everyone can have a turn. Uh, well, if you have something to say on the agenda, you may, not something away from the agenda. Is it on the agenda? Okay, go ahead. It's, it's the microphone and it's down. I wanted to comment on the uh, stock option kind of plan. First, I could not understand what the changes were that is from the old plan to the new one. Second, I think that it's important that it's recognized when you vote in favor of this, that 100% of the stock in this company will be diluted by 100% in 25 years because it authorizes 4% per year of stock to be issued under that plan. Warren Buffett said with Coca-Cola, it's outrageous. So I object to the executive compensation plan. Of course, under having already taken all the proxies, comments with respect to resolution are irre irrelevant. That doesn't seem right in the operation of the meeting as well. Thank you. Obviously, we have prepared a proxy statement with uh, the board's recommendation on the equity incentive plan that addresses many of those issues. If anyone wants to refer to the proxy, they, they certainly may. Uh, going back to Elon's presentation just briefly, during the course of his remarks, we may discuss our business outlook and make other forward-looking statements. Such statements are predictions based on our current expectations. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those disclosed in our most recent Form 10-Q filed with the SEC. Such forward-looking statements represent our views as of today, should not be relied on thereafter, and we may disclaim any obligation to update them at, after today. So with that, please welcome Elon Musk. All right, so welcome everyone, um, and uh, as always, thanks for being an investor. Um, so we'll, we'll do just a, a few slides and then uh, go into questions. So if, let's see, I have this uh, complicated device which has two buttons. <laughs> 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 a 
blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> something, something. Um, so, um, so it's, it's been a great year. Uh, we've, we've, um, sorry, uh, let me speak close to the mic. It's been a great year. Uh, we've we've um, uh, produced and sold a lot of cars. We're now at uh, 344 miles, a million miles driven. Um, and um, you know, sort of pleased to say, sort of you know, touch wood, uh, that uh, uh, n n no one has received a, a serious permanent injury in a Tesla ever, in all those miles driven. So. And, and, and I mean that is that is certainly one of our uh, proudest accomplishments, um, and and there've been some some pretty crazy crashes I should say as well. Um, we've had a guy. In fact, things that I wasn't you know sure that really it would work out it so well. I mean there was there's a guy that drove through uh, two concrete walls at 110 miles an hour. Um, there was I always used to say, well, you know, I think the car is really safe unless you drive it off a cliff, and then somebody drove it off a cliff. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> um, so that's that's looking good. Um, we've we've got uh, 126 uh, locations around the world, uh, from China to, to Norway. Um, service centers, uh, lots of superchargers. We're we're actually trying to accelerate the, the rollout of uh, superchargers uh, even more. In fact, by the end of this year, we'll probably have doubled doubled that number of superchargers. So there's a huge number of supercharger locations uh, in process. <clears throat> and um, for Tesla, it, it, you know, we're, we're, we have to come up with the sort of the whole solution um, so you have a, a really great uh, driving experience all the way from when you think about buying the car to uh, receiving it, uh, driving it, s servicing the whole works, um, and uh, you know, and then of course charging it. So we're, I think it's important. When you, you create a product, to think of like, well, at, at a high level, what is someone trying to achieve? Um, and you know, obviously, with a car, it's they need to go from one place to another, um, and so we want that whole experience to be as positive as possible. Um, and we really want people to to love their love their car. Um, and uh, in fact, my goal is that people like the Model S more than their house. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, th I think that is actually the case in, 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 in some situations. Um, and, uh, you know, th there just aren't that many products that, that really give people joy and would like to be one of those products. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about some of the uh, software that's coming out later this year that will be provided to uh, all Model S uh, owners um, that's really going to personalize the car uh, a lot more. I mean, there's uh, ranging from the highly functional to the, uh, you know, not, um, <laughs> not, not, not that functional. Like there's the, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to name your car, uh, <laughs> and, and, and it'll show up in the mobile app as that name. Um, so I've, I found her too, and it's uh, Old Faithful. Uh, <laughs> um, and there's going to be a lot of uh, sort of uh, customization where the car kind of learns your behavior. Um, and uh, it just automatically adjusts to, to what you want. Uh, so things like traffic-based directions and um, uh, you know, calendar integration and anticipate, you know, anticipating where you're going, alerting you if there's traffic along the way, um, and an alternate route may be better, that kind of thing. So we expect to have that rolling out uh, fairly soon. So yeah, I mentioned the um, navigation enhancements. Um, in, in particular, traffic um, traffic optimized directions I think is is really important. Uh, so, the um, what we're doing is is similar to maybe what you've experienced with uh, with Waze, where you have uh, the the cars operating collaboratively as a network, um, sort of a sort of a crowdsourced intelligence as to the traffic uh, information. Um, so as the number of Model S's in a neighborhood increases, the quality of the traffic will actually improve uh, quite considerably. And we're also bringing in uh, data source, multiple other data sources. So there's like, uh, something like 20 million other data sources, uh, but with priority given to the Model S as a data source. So in you know, places like the Barrier Peninsula, it should be pretty great. 
uh, or West LA, and you know. But as, 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 as the Tesla's increased, that, that's going to get better and better. Um, yeah. And then we've, we've also introduced a number of hardware improvements um, over the past year. Uh, a lot of subtle things, uh, but they're important. A number of areas like power folding mirrors, um, parking sensors, um, and then of course the sort of uh, underbody shields, uh, which I mean aren't, aren't really necessary, but you know it's sort of you know it's uh, really helpful uh, to know that you can drive over a concrete block and be okay. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, sales have been pretty good, um, and uh, still obviously room for improvement, uh, but uh, a good start. And um, uh, you know, we've really been uh, production limited, as I think uh, most people know, uh, uh, with the, the, the biggest constraint being supply of the, the battery cells, and that, that constraint is sort of gradually alleviated over the course of uh, this year and, the, and then next. Um, so we expect to steadily ramp up the production. Um, in some cases, there'll be you know, important step changes, uh, significant step changes in, in the uh, number of cars that we can produce. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll be going into uh, more markets as well. So this is uh, kind of where we started out. Um, obviously, not in a good place with respect to gross margin. Um, yeah, but then ultimately ending up uh, in like, with a pretty good uh, gross margin per car sold. And we do expect a steady improvement uh, in the gross margin, uh, despite the, what I think is likely to occur, what we're seeing, we're seeing to some degree occur, which is that the, um, the number of options or the, the value of the options that people are picking for the car is slightly reducing uh, because of you know, basically affordability. So, so we'd expect to see um, a slight decrease from people spending, you know, on the order of $100,000 a car to, you know, maybe $95,000 a car, which is still quite a lot. Um, so. And uh, yeah, so we, we've uh, expanded uh, to some some very significant markets recently. I was uh, sorry, I'll talk later. Uh, I was over in in China, and we. Uh, we have very good re reception there. There's a lot of interest uh, in the car, so we're making dramatic uh, investment or significant investments in uh, service centers and superchargers in China, in order to to meet the demand. Um, in fact, uh, our biggest constraint really is how fast can we uh, open the service centers and in install superchargers and make sure uh, any local uh, charging issues are solved. Um, you know, with each market. There are idiosyncratic uh, issues around charging uh, that relate to you know, building codes, to the way that the electricity grid works, um, and, um, and these can be quite uh, difficult to solve. Uh, and uh, we had some challenges, for example, uh, in, in Norway, which is our highest sales per capita in the world, but they've got a unique uh, electricity grid. Um, and it took us several months to get to a good uh, solution there. So in, in in, um, in, in markets that we're opening up right now, we're actually intentionally uh, slowing down the introduction until we're certain that the service, uh, that there'll be good, good servicing and good charging capability, because we don't want to have people to have a negative experience. Um, and then in terms of right-hand drive markets, uh, I'm headed to London this weekend to hand over the first uh, right-hand drive cars. Um, and then we'll be going into Japan, Australia, Hong Kong, and a number of other markets uh, later this year. Uh, the Gigafactory, I think you, uh, people uh, know what our situation is there. Um, we are getting quite advanced in the uh, planning for the, the Gigafactory. Um, and overall, I'm quite optimistic about the, the potential cost reduction in the, the cost per unit of energy. Um, you know, I think we're, we're targeting a minimum of 30% of um, reduction. And I think that's probably conservative at this point. I think we can probably do uh, better than that with, with the Gigafactory. Um, and uh, I, I feel also really good about our partnership with, uh, with Panasonic. Uh, we have uh, daily meetings with Panasonic. Um, and then every week, there's sort of a more comprehensive meeting. Um, and um, Panasonic at first wasn't sure about 
whether the, these cost reductions could be achieved, but I think they are, they are now uh, convinced they can. Uh, and of course, there's good old Model X. Um, so um, the, I, I should say that the production version of the Model X actually looks different from this. Um, it, it looks better. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that drives me crazy about cars is that you know, very often you'll see kind of a show car or a demo car, and then the production version is some much worse version of that. Um, and at Tesla, whenever we show off a car as a demonstration item, the production car will always be better than what people saw. Um, and now sometimes that takes a lot of effort and it's very difficult. Um, that certainly is the case with the Model X. Um, but we had two choices, which is either produce a, an, a, an amazing car that I think is going to blow people away, or produce a pretty good car. And, uh, you know, we, we want to have amazing cars that, that just blow people away. So the, in the case of the Model X, that's just taken a bit longer than um, we would have liked. Uh, in particular, getting the falcon wing door right is extremely difficult. Um, uh, and then things that you maybe wouldn't expect are also very difficult, like the, the second row seats um, are, are quite, a, quite a challenge because what we're aiming for with the Model X is that when you open the falcon wing door, you have the second row seats are essentially framed. Um, and we want that to, be, to feel like... Uh, like a work of art. Like you, if you open up the, the door, it, it should just be this amazing experience. Um, I mean, it's, this may sound a bit silly, but it should just be like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, the, and then, and then the, the seat, I mean, it's just a seat, but we want the seat to be like, feel like a work of art, like something you could have in a museum. Um, Anyway, that's what we're going for with the Model X, and it's bloody hard. <laughs> um, there. Uh, and, and of course, it'll have the dual motor all-wheel drive, um, and, uh, and then we expect to start to reach volume production in the second quarter next year. And then, you know, Tesla's always been, the, the grand strategy of Tesla has always been a three-step process, where step one was uh, low volume, uh, high-priced car with the Roadster. Then we've got mid-volume, mid, mid to high-priced car with the Model S. And then uh, Generation 3 being the high-volume, uh, lower-cost car. Um, and with, um, with, with, with Gen 3, uh, with, with our third car, uh, you know, we're expecting that to be about a $35,000 car with a range in excess of 200 miles. Um, but I should say that 35000 may not sound all that affordable, but when you consider the, the savings from use of electricity versus gasoline, in the U.S. that translates effectively to like a gasoline car of about maybe $28,000, or in Europe, uh, a gasoline car of about twenty-two dollars to $24,000. So it actually, the affordability of it is, should, be, should be quite high, and very optimistic about that. And, um, and, and we're going to try to make that third-generation car happen as soon as we possibly can. Obviously, the the Gigafactory is a precursor to the creation of that car, uh, or the volume production of that car. So we've got to make sure that uh, the Gigafactory and the uh, tooling and development of that, th that Gen 3 car move uh, in sync to uh, uh, market release in, in hopefully sort of the, the late uh, 2016 timeframe. Um, then uh, we... Um, completed our, our coast to coast uh, connection with the superchargers uh, so you can travel to um, you know, fr from LA to New York uh, via and <laughs> via an, an admittedly circuitous route <laughs> uh, and I, 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 actually I don't think we did a good job of explaining to the media like well why is this weird route that way um, and it's because it was originally the route that I was going to take uh, my family on, on a road trip. <laughs> and, um, and then 
we, it ended up taking us a bit longer to complete the route because of, of sort of heavy icing conditions in the winter. And then by the time it was completed, the kids were in school and it would have been difficult to take them out for a week. So we just had a Tesla team do a cross-country uh, trip. Um, and then a bunch of customers did it. Actually, uh, I think a customer did it before we did it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, but we, we set sort of a Guinness Book of World Record uh, for the uh, fastest trip uh, from LA to New York in an electric car. And, um, and then, of course, it, by, by the end of this year, we'll have filled out a bunch of more routes. So you'll be able to go uh, in a much more direct manner to New York uh, or from, um, say, LA to Florida. Uh, of course, the, you can go all up and down the east and west coasts. And um, anyway, so you'll see that map sort of mostly filled in um, by the end of this year, and then something similar for, for Europe, and we'll be making good progress, I think, in China and other parts of the world on the supercharger front. All right, so uh, questions? See, so I think we're, we're going to... So if, 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 if those who have questions could line up at the microphones, and I'll just go from one to the other. No, it's okay. Jeff, do you want to start? It's not on. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Hi. Um, my name is Benjamin. And um, since the deal with Toyota had actually fallen through and, you know, the, they no longer wanted batteries and actually wanted to switch over to hydrogen fuel cells. I wanted to get your opinion on now that gas is going to be going off and you're going to be competing with infrastructure for hydrogen fuel cells and electric uh, charging stations, what is your outlook on that, like the competition between the emerging, the re-emerging of hydrogen fuel cells uh, in the talks between the... Um, car companies and such. Uh, yeah, so I mean, first of all, I should say um, it, it talks with Toyota didn't really uh, fall through. Um, it's just, you know, we, we were sort of coming to the end of the uh, uh, RAV, electric RAV4 program, and uh, Toyota was interested in doing uh, sort of a, a high volume um, deal for battery packs and powertrains, but uh, we're just not in a position to be able to supply them. So we, we just, we, until we alleviate the cell supply constraint, it's not really possible for us to do a high volume deal. Um, so what we agreed with Toyota to do was to just sort of put things on hold for now and circle back um, maybe in a year or two uh, once we alleviate the, the cell supply constraint. Um, because otherwise we're simply just moving, you know, one car from say Tesla to Toyota and it's just, it's not really accomplishing anything. So the but that's why we're so gung-ho on the, the gigafactories. We, we've got to get that done in order to ensure that there's enough lithium-ion uh, supply in the world. Um, as people probably know, I'm not the biggest uh, fan of fuel cells. Um, I usually call them fool cells. Um, <laughs> but, um, and I mean, I think like a good rule of thumb for any storage technology would be to sort of say, well, Let's consider some very high value situations where uh, electric energy storage um, has, is, is extremely important and, and gives a product a great advantage. You can say, well, let's think of like cell phones. Like a cell phone that lasts longer um, is a key strategic advantage. Gee, nobody's using fuel cells there. Um, well, okay, well, what about something really expensive? How about a $200 million satellite? Oh, wow, nobody's using fuel cells there either. Huh. Okay. Case closed. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hello. My remarks are for you, Mr. Dusk, and also for Dr. Jérôme Guillen. And um, just to remind you that in the developed countries, we have a lot of women who would like to buy Teslas but they need to be a little bit more uh, women favorable. <laughs> um, those of us who have uh, sufficient buying power are generally not the younger, but the sort of older generation, and we're not as tall as the men or as the younger generation. So we have a little bit of difficulty getting to the pedals and also 
being higher on the seats. Okay. So my remarks to you, Mr. Rusk and Dr. Guillen, who is like the godfather of the Model S, is to make it a little bit more friendly to the women. <laughs> because after all, <laughs> after all, we are a majority. That's... <laughs> well... <laughs> And finally, I would like to say that uh, whoever has a car, they should say yum when they approach the car. And the Teslas are definitely yum, yum, <laughs> yum. Thank you. Well, thank you. You have a good point. Thank you. It's, uh, um, I, I should say we are, um, with, with, the, with the Model X, we're, we're certainly paying more attention to um, uh, the needs of uh, women in the Model X. Uh, and I think you're, you're right. We're, we probably got a little too guy-centric on the, on the S. Uh, so we're hoping to correct that with the, with the X. So. Hello, Mr. Musk. My name is Russell Kinsella, and I'm a satisfied shareholder. My question today is actually about the non-trivial matter of the merchandise Tesla sells in its stores, which also <laughs> function more or less as a uniform for the Tesla um, product specialists. Right. I just wanted to know if there was any uh, consideration to improve or update these as a way to bring them in line with the Tesla brand. Thank you. Yes, I think a good point indeed that we are um, planning to do that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. You know, you're right, you're right. Uh, Satoshi Musa from LA. Um, I have a question about the Model X and as you ramp up um, and obviously it's, there's battery issues, I mean supply issues, um, and I'm sure there's more demand than supply. Are you going to be able to ramp up or are you planning to ramp up even from the initial target that you had for the 2015 year and the years after? And will it come with a optional upgradable seats? Um, so we're going to try to uh, ensure that vehicle production mat matches the availability of battery cells. Um, and obviously, we have some external dependencies on that front, um, but uh, we're, we're going to try to ramp up as, as fast as we, we possibly can. So I think um, uh, you know, at some point, we'll probably hit some uh, you know, customer demand limit, but we're going to ramp up as rapidly as we can, ramp up production, and, and see what that limit ends up being. But it's difficult for us to say with certainty what it is, but, but we're going to try our best to increase our production. Um, and, uh, and, and then see what, what, what the demand uh, limit is. Um, on the seats front, um, um, I, I have to admit that uh, his, historically our seats have not been the best. Um, and we are planning on offering an upgraded seat later this year um, that, that will be both sportier and more comfortable. Uh, and it will be offered as a retrofit as well. So if you want to upgrade your prior car, you can do that. Um, in the meantime, we've, we actually have made a number of uh, subtle improvements to the seat comfort um, in terms of improving the, 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 the foam, uh, the type of foam that's, that's on the seat. Uh, and um, we, we kind of oversprung the seat so that it's a, little too, uh, it's a little too tight in terms of the springs under the seat. So it, it causes the seat to crown slightly. Uh, and uh, so we fixed that. Um, and then the lumbar support is slightly too forward, so we've, we've also fixed that. So all of those changes are going into the seats. Most of them are already done. The lumbar support, I think, is about a month away. Um, and they make uh, quite a substantial difference to the, the comfort of even the base seat. Uh, yeah, sorry. Seats have been like a thing. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Musk. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, with regards to Gen 3, or maybe not, uh, from what I understand, Tesla has abandoned the trademark for Model E. Oh, I got a funny story on that front. Yeah. So, <laughs> apart from an apparent desire to break the world's greatest combo, yes. what motivated this decision? I just kind of want to get a sense for the thinking there. Yeah, so, uh, let me tell you our, our sort of very, you know, deep thought process on... Um, <laughs> On, on branding here. Um, so we have the S and the X, and then you know, a friend asked me at a party, hey, what are you going to call a third generation car? I was like, well, we've got the S and the X, we might as well make it the E, you know. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, and then it kind of stuck, um, even, though, <laughs> even though we're just kidding. Um, and then, and then just, just to sort of add to it, we also, just, just for laughs, uh, trademarked the model Y. Um, <laughs> Um, and, uh, but I guess it's, it's, things are pretty dry in the trademark world, so <laughs> <laughs> nobody picked up on that. Um, and anyway, the, then, um, the, the, then, then Ford, Ford gave us a call and said they were going to sue us uh, for using Model E. And we're like, okay, like Ford's killing sex. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> that's going to end up on Twitter. Um, so anyway, like, okay, fine, we won't use the Model E. Um, and so now we were thinking, like, well, you know, maybe, we, maybe there's something else we can use. So uh, we're, we're trying a few, few other ones, and the, the trademarks are in process, the applications are in process, so I can't say what they are. But I think, I think we've got something that might be, that might be a good, might work out pretty well. Cool. <laughs> okay. um, hi, uh, Roy Philippos. Uh, philosopher and entrepreneur from Philadelphia, uh, Tesla shareholder. Um, uh, two years ago, I was here asking you about Model S sales, and you had mentioned to me uh, 8,000 was a break even unit. And it seemed like now much more better things have occurred, which is good. Good for all Tesla shareholders. Um, a question today is that you had mentioned that you're planning to step down from Tesla as a CEO at one point. Can you talk more about that? And as well as, who would you want to be the CEO of the company um, after you do step down from that position? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, you know, nobody's a CEO of a, of a company forever. I mean, eventually, you know, they, they carry you out. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, in my case, uh, I mean, it is, it, is, it is quite difficult, I would say, being the CEO of two companies. Um, and it was never my intention to, to be CEO. I tried to actually not be CEO quite hard. And um, eventually it was sort of, it was either that or the company wasn't going to make it. So, or at least I have to give it a try. Um, so, um, you know, w w what I've committed to is to be CEO of the company through volume production of the third generation car. Um, so that's, you know, somewhere in the, I don't know, four, four or five year time frame. Um, and then um, I'll have to see, you know, how, how things are going at that point and whether uh, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know if, 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 if it's sort of manageable to, to do that on a personal level, you know, without getting burnt out, essentially, then I'll keep doing it. Otherwise, I'm, I'll probably have to uh, find someone else. But we've got a lot of time to, to sort that out. So you're talking maybe a few years then, pretty much when the volume production car comes. I, I, I think I, I will, yeah, so certainly be um, CEO for like say four or five years, and then it's sort of TBD after that. Um, but uh, yeah, but that, that that's the commitment I made to people uh, at Tesla and also to investors is is that I'm going to make sure that uh, we execute through the. Uh, high volume um, affordable car uh, at a minimum, and then we will evaluate at that point. Okay. Just, just a quick follow up. Um, I've been asking to speak to you now for two years um, to talk to you to tell you that I'm also a super genius like yourself. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not sorry. I'm not, sure I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure I'm one, but all right. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying to serious. This is all, to all benefit of Tesla shareholders in, in the world. I am a capitalist like yourself. I am also a level two stage. I've been waiting for 10 years now for someone to give me a second look, a full second look. And if they did, they would see a very advanced mind in front of them. So I'm asking you today, can you give me a second look? Um, okay, I mean, I'm not sure what, uh, second look in what, what, what I'm not sure in what uh, regard. I, I would like to come on board as vice chairman of Tesla. To <laughs> Uh, well, uh, we don't really have a vice chairman spot, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't think, 
I'd have to say, uh, no, I'm probably sorry. I, I'm sorry, I can also apply for a future CEO position, but I would, at, at, least, I, at least I would like to come on the board of the directors. I apologize. Is it to the benefit of Tesla shareholders? Uh, I, I think we need to move on to another, another question. My apologies. I um, apologize. Thank you for your time. All right. uh, hello, Mr. Musk. Uh, I know that your long-term goal is, rather than just to sell Teslas, but to accelerate the electric vehicle market around the world. And it seems like no one's really matching what we're doing at Tesla with the supercharger network as far as rapid charging and battery swapping of high energy batteries. I was wondering, would it, to advance the long-term goal, much long-term goal, would it ever make sense to open this supercharger or a similar charger, maybe a junior charger station, to other manufacturers, maybe on a subscription basis, or to work with them to make their cars compatible as well? Since it seems like no one else just wants to put in the effort to make anything close to the supercharger in terms of capacity. Yeah, so the, the intent of the superchargers is not to create some sort of walled garden or anything. It's, it, we're actually happy to have other manufacturers use the superchargers. They just need to other, create electric cars that can accept the energy level or the power level of a supercharger. So the superchargers, the current generation superchargers, uh, put out 135 kilowatts, um, and we're you know, planning to go up from there. Uh, but there's, there's no other electric car that can accept anything close to 135 kilowatts. Um, we're, we're more than happy to have under other manufacturers do this, and I've said this publicly on a few occasions. Um, no, no one's approached us and said, well, they'd like to use it, um, but, but we're happy to have them do so. Um, they, they would just have to contribute to, to, to the capital cost, like so we'll figure out like, okay, well, what percentage of the time are their cars using the supercharger network, and then they can make a contribution proportionate to their customer usage of the supercharger network. We're, we're very open to such a thing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Musk, I'm from Los Angeles, and I would uh, like to buy a rally jacket of the team that went to New York. Okay. And you don't sell it. I All right, well, I think we should. <laughs> following the comment of somebody else about redesigning the uh, Tesla accessories, that that be an accessory. But certainly most of the people who were there with me watching the guys get started, wow, how do we get that? And it's not available. But the real issue I am raising today is the superchargers are unique and placed individually. How about putting them on a metal platform on a flatbed and dropping them in place and it's done instead of all the construction you do. Cookie cutter prefab. I invite you to think about it. It may cut cost and speed in delivery. Okay, thanks. Hi, Mr. Musk. I'm Ben Clark. I'm a huge fan, uh, happy shareholder, happy Model S owner, hopeful future occupant of Mars. Um, <laughs> so I'm very thankful for the time that you, you give around the world and kind of regularly answering these questions and talking to the public. It's a huge benefit to a lot of um, current and future engineers and innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, I've heard you talk a lot about your desire to accelerate the advent of electric vehicles. Um, I get the sense that you'd be extremely happy if all the major competitors came out tomorrow and announced long-range electric vehicles that, that had great styling and performance and low cost. Yeah, um, even to the point that I think you would you would feel personally satisfied if Tesla Motors was put out of business by all these great electric vehicles <laughs> driving around. Well, yeah, <laughs> I don't know about that. At, at least having satisfied your goal of bringing it out. So yeah. The automotive market is big. I'm sure there's, there's certainly room for many companies. Um, um, so I'm I'm just kind of curious. How do you balance your your desire to bring the advent of electric vehicles and wanting your competitors to have these great great vehicles that are benefiting the world with your kind of fiduciary responsibility of, of maximizing shareholder value. And if you can give any examples kind of how you make those trade-offs and what future decisions you might anticipate. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it, it, is, it is surprising that there hasn't been more activity from other car companies to, to make uh, serious electric vehicles. Um, I mean, thus far, what we've seen is really, um, you know, the number of electric cars they make is, is the minimum required to satisfy regulations. 
um, and then when those regulations are watered down, then they, they reduce or eliminate the electric vehicle program. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's surprising, and I, I, I sort of really was, was hoping that um, other car companies would, would, would engage in more serious electric car programs. Um, and I'm trying to think of ways to, to help that along um, that, that, would, uh, that would be a good outcome. I mean, I, I, don't think, you know, I don't think their success is necessarily to Tesla's uh, detriment um, because ultimately we need all electric cars to, all, all cars to go electric. And, and the car market is enormous. I mean, there's um, 100 million new cars made a year and there's an existing fleet of, of roughly 2 billion cars. So even if all cars were electric, Im immediately all new cars produced, it would take 20 years to replace the fleet. Um, and if you look at the sort of puny number of cars that Tesla makes, um, you know, we're to 22,500 last year. Um, you know, maybe we'll do sort of 35 this year. It's a big percentage increase, but it's a very tiny percentage of the overall market. Um, and we've got a long way to go uh, just to get next to the decimal point in terms of market share. <laughs> yeah, like one zero over. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm contemplating doing something, you know, fairly significant on that front, which should be kind of controversial with respect to Tesla's patents. Um, and, uh, but I, I want to, I, I, I will probably want to write something so that I can articulate it properly uh, and explain the reasoning uh, for the decision. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Hello, my name's David. I'm a shareholder. I have a question relating to batteries. Um, how concerned are you about a new battery uh, chemistry such as a dual carbon battery? And how quickly could this gigafactory be retooled to make this new battery? You know, it's rare that a day goes by when there's not some new battery chemistry uh, that, that is announced. Um, but I, I, I should maybe give people a good filter for assessing um, a, any new battery chemistry in terms of its potential. Um, the, the key metric is energy density, so energy per unit mass or volume. Um, this is different from power density. Uh, power density is the rate at which you can extract energy. Uh, energy is like the, is, the, is the total amount you have in there. How, the energy, energy defines your range, uh, and, and power defines your acceleration and charge rate. Uh, the problem with uh, something like the dual carbon approach is that the energy density is very low. It's only about maybe 20% of, of our current cell energy density. So, um, now, the power density is very high. You can charge it uh, you know, quickly, um, but uh, th but that's we, we don't have a constraint on power. The Model S really has a lot of power, so um, range and, and and really the the cost per unit energy. Those are the two things that are important. Now, now something like a, the dual carbon is actually okay in terms of the cost per unit energy, but it really uh, fails hard on the uh, energy density. Um, there are potential breakthroughs out there. Uh, but uh, we have yet to see one, to see even a single example in our lab of, of a cell working at the laboratory level that, that is better than the one that, that we have or the ones that we expect to come out with. Um, and so my response always when I hear about um, uh, electrochemical breakthroughs is, please send us a sample cell that usually, well, that has always <laughs> has resulted in uh, nothing happening. <laughs> Thank you. <So. laughs> Hi. Hi, Mr. Marks. Um, I'm Kevin Wang. Uh, my question is related to Model X and the Generation 3rd. Um, and speaking of the other uh, car manufacturer activity, recently I attended the BMW i3 test drive event. And uh, since I have been greatly spoiled by Model S, I wouldn't you know, walk away as a 
i3 buyer. But however, there's one thing impressed me very much is that the uh, tremendous interest from the consumer showing up. So it's kind of a tent event and then running the test drive all day long and then hundreds of people kind of sign up. So it just come to me that uh, you know, if Tesla has the Model E or Y <laughs> ready, <laughs> they'll be selling like hot cake. But yes. then, and looking in your um, roadmap, uh, Model X still have the priority. So I wonder, uh, you know, is it that it takes this much time for you to learn how to build generation third, or is that any of the resource constraint like battery? Just wonder if you could share some of the rationale in terms of priority. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that's, that's important is to have a, a compelling mass market car. Um, so, I mean, I, I drove the i3, and it's not bad, but it's, it's, uh, the range is very short. Right. Um, it's okay uh, in other respects, um, but it's just, it, it would be hard to say for most people that you could replace your gasoline car with an i3. Um, I'm not impressed by i3 at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying that if you have the Model E ready, right. that you could take over the market. Sure. Um, so the, the, the issue there is in order for us to create a com compelling mass market car, we need um, a lot of battery production, uh, and it needs to be at a affordable enough price that it doesn't cause the, it, it doesn't destroy the affordability of the car. So, um, so that, that's why you know, the, the Gigafactory is vital for uh, getting to that level of volume um, and for reducing the cost via um, massive economies of scale um, and vertical integration. Um, now, there will be, I should say, technological innovations in the cell as well as uh, the um, sort of monster economies of scale. But what we're trying to do is dial everything to the, to the maximum to, um, to get to that affordable, uh, a compelling electric car, compelling meaning it's got to be long range um, as soon as possible. The soonest we can figure out how to do that is sort of the late 2016 time frame. Um, so that's, that's what we're aiming for. I mean, we could obviously produce a car like the i3, or, or maybe I think probably better than the i3 right now, um, but it just it wouldn't be great. It would be okay, and it wouldn't, but it wouldn't really, you know, it wouldn't be amazing. So. Uh, one quick follow-up. So that leads to the Giga factory. And as I understand you, right now you choose two states simultaneously. So at what time frame you will go with the final state? Yeah, so we're probably going to do two or maybe three states uh, all the way to uh, creating a foundation and completing the, the, the plans and getting approvals and everything. Um, I think it, it might actually be three states that we do it in. So um, I wouldn't expect that we do a down select uh, for Gigafactory 1 uh, before the end of the year. Great. Thank you. I would just like to re-ask my question of how quickly could that new battery chemistry um, composition, how quickly could the Gigafactory be retooled for that new battery composition? Oh, it would be uh, fairly straightforward for us to change the anode or cathode uh, composition. Okay, thank you. Yeah. In fact, we expect to evolve the anode and cathode. It's not merely uh, what if that happens, we expect that to happen. Hi, Mr. Musk. My name is Bob Ashmore. I'm a shareholder. I'm a Roadster owner and a Model S owner. And I have a question about if you're planning on any upgrades or enhancements to the Roadster, and if not, when I can expect another Roadster-type vehicle. Uh, so, yes, we, we are planning on, um, I think, a fairly exciting upgrade to the Roadster. Um, uh, I'm hoping we can get it done later this year. Um, I, did, I did say it would be this year, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to, to sort of, I mean, uh, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll get it done this year. There'll be a cool thing. <laughs> it's like, add straw, <laughs> add straw to back. <laughs> but, you know, we, we said we'd do it, we're going to do it. So we're going we're gonna to do something cool with Roadster uh, before the end of this year. Um, and, uh, and in terms of a, a next generation Roadster, it's that's probably, I don't know, five years away, uh, something